In this video, we're going to walk through the Microsoft Learn Lab about protecting your virtual machine settings with Azure Automatic State Configuration. Now, this automated state configuration is an awesome feature built into Windows, not just with Azure, uh, that allows us to manual or to automatically configure multiple virtual machines or multiple machines in our environment to have a standard configuration. Not only can we configure them to have a standard configuration, but we can also configure them to automatically resolve any changes in their configuration over time. So let's go ahead and get started. So it talks about uh, when we deploy our virtual machines in our environment or servers or even desktops in our environment, we have a built configuration. Oftentimes this is a standard configuration that we hold to pretty rigorously as we're creating the new machines. For instance, if you have a web server uh, that's in a cluster of web servers, you probably have a very strong configuration that you complete across all web servers in that cluster. However, over time, you can have what's called drift to where some machines start changing a little bit from other machines and they slowly start drifting apart from their standards. While a little bit of drift isn't necessarily a problem, over time, this little bit of drift can become fairly problematic. And so you want a way to be able to maintain all of the configurations amongst all of the machines. In this example, talking about a website where we may have 10 or 20 or even 100 virtual machines, all that compose this website. And so we want all of them to look exactly the same. So we, in order to fix this, well, we can use the Azure Automatic Configuration. Well, first let's talk about what is the automation state configuration. Well, it utilizes what's called desired state configuration. Basically what we're able to do is we're able to define in a document what our desired state should look like, and then the machines can automatically resolve themselves to look exactly like that. So we don't even have to uh, go in and manually configure them. Basically what we do is we say, hey you, you're a web server, web servers look like X, and then the web server automatically makes itself look like that. Now desired state configuration is a feature that is that comes with PowerShell, uh, and so it uses some PowerShell nomenclature in order to make it work. Uh, so for example, what is DSC? How does desired state configuration work? Well, we've got a sample right here. Let's say that we have in our web servers, we have a share uh, that's called my file share. And we want this share to exist on all of the web servers in our environment. And so we create a PowerShell command to do this and we try to automate it across the, all of our machines. Uh, so what we're doing is we're sharing out, in this case, the C colon backslash shared folder. We're sharing that as my file share. We're giving full access to user one, and we're giving read access only to user two. Uh, so this command, fairly simple PowerShell command, goes ahead and creates the file share for that. Well, that works great the first time we deploy that throughout all of the machines in our environment, all of the web servers we might be interested in. However, we may need to run this again because some of those shares aren't working properly. So we then try to run this again and what happens is it tries to create a new file share on machines that may already have a file share and therefore start giving us some alerts. Additionally, if these users, user one and user two, don't exist on that computer, then additional issues can start happening with regards to trying to grant access to users that don't exist. So while this command works in an, in an ideal environment, we're not always talking about an ideal environment and therefore we have to start creating some, some uh, additional uh, fabric around it or some additional controls around it to make it work properly. As an example, this next script, we start talking about how to make that a little bit more intelligent. For instance, uh, we start off by assuming the share doesn't exist. Well, we kind of assumed that already, but we're checking it out just in case. We then do a get smb share command to look for that share. 
does the share my file share exist? And if so, then go ahead and put that value there. And then we say, okay, does, does the share exist? Uh, if so, then say, yeah, the this share are already exists. You're trying to create something that's already there. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change that share exists flag to true so that we can then do something different with it later. We then say, okay, uh, if that share doesn't exist, then let's go ahead and we'll create that share. Otherwise, we're gonna send out some other messages saying, um, you know, maybe the permissions don't exist. Um, maybe we need to create the users. And so we can keep going further and further into this, looking for various cases, uh, various scenarios where some, some configurations need to be tweaked just a little bit as opposed to others. This is kind of a, a scripted method, a traditional scripted method for configuring machines. Basically walking through a process and trying to figure out, well, what we want to do is we just want to create the file share. But then we start finding some scenarios where we can't just create the file share. We have to look to see if the share is there, which we do that. And then we start saying, well, what if user one isn't there? Well, then we have to start looking into additional options. And so if user one isn't there and user two isn't there, and you know what, we said create the share, but what if that folder isn't there? So we start having edge cases where we have to be a little bit more specific in our environment. Desired state configuration, however, does what's called a, uh, a, a an expected case. Um, basically what happens is you give it the desired state and it is able to make itself to that point. And we can see right here is an example of desired state configuration. And basically what we're saying is, hey, we have a, a share called my file share that we want to be present on this computer. Not only does the share have to exist, but it's supposed to be in that path. It's supposed to give read, read access to that user, full access to that user, and have this description. Now, because this is a desired state or a configuration-based design, what happens is when DSC sees this configuration, it says, well, I have a share, but it's in a different folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna change it to that new folder. Um, I have user one, but I don't have user two. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create user two. Or I'm gonna set the uh, uh, share permissions properly. Uh, it didn't have a description before. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna set the description. It goes through and it evaluates all of these options and then only changes them if necessary. This is what's referred to as an item potent configuration, something that intelligently identifies, uh, I'm sorry, intelligently looks to see if a change is needed and then only makes those changes that are necessary. All right, so that's the overall idea behind desired state configuration is we define a desired state and then it automatically configures itself accordingly. There's a few more details. For instance, there's a local configuration manager that we can do when we're working on, say, just one machine um, or easily use with just one machine. Local configuration manager runs on Windows and, well, manages the local configuration. Working with the LCM, there's two different ways. There's both a push and a pull architecture. First off is a push architecture, and you can kind of see in the diagram down here, we have the administrator on a workstation, such as a mobile laptop, and he is pushing configurations out to these virtual machines. And then the virtual machines automatically configure themselves accordingly. It's fairly quick, it's fairly easy, it's simple to set up. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily allow for changes in the future as easily. In the pull method, what happens is the, the administrator sets up a pull server and then the machines will go to that pull server on a regular basis, uh, looks like every 15 minutes, and we'll say, do you have a configuration for me? It will then download that configuration and make the changes as appropriate. Now the good thing about the pull server is you now have one central location that everybody's looking to for configurations, and so if you make the change once, it then gets applied to everybody. 
and you don't have to re remember to push the new configuration to all the machines. Uh, the only drawback for the pull method, you have to have the server available for everybody to pull against. Uh, let's see, requirements, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, general knowledge. Um, what does Azure Automation State Configuration? It is a declarative management platform. Yes, we are declaring what the configuration should look like. So it's a declarative management platform. Uh, PowerShell DSC script, let's see, contains the steps. Nope, is item potent. What should you use to pull instead of push? Pull mode, why should you use, excuse me. For complex environments, true. Uh, it's not as easy to set up as push is. I'm gonna say complex environments, redundancy, and scale. All right, I missed one, I missed two. What? PowerShell DSC is declarative management platform. Uh, yes, that's exactly what I selected. Their questions are wrong. All right, moving forward. Talking more about DSC and their desired state. Yes, declarative task oriented scripting language. So we decl def declare what we want the configuration to look like and it automatically configures itself. There are lots of different DSC options or uh, configuration types that we can do. For instance, we can configure files and folders on the machines, archives, various environment configurations, packages, registries, scripts, windows features, and so on. Basic breakdown of DSC code. I won't go too far into this. I'll let you read it yourself. Uh, we start off with a configuration. This is basically the name of the configuration of what we're doing. You then have the node, which will help define, for instance, if you have multiple nodes in your configuration, which we'll talk about shortly. Uh, we'll have an example of like web server one, web server two, web server three. And then we have the various configurations that we're looking at. For instance, in this case, Windows feature. If we look up above, we saw Windows feature. We could also create users, define processes, services, and so on. Uh, in this case, Windows feature, we're calling it my feature. And what we're doing is we're saying web server should be present. Uh, let's see, yeah, there we can see there's multiple nodes. And then we can also include what's called a data block, which can be referenced by the, by the content. Uh, and we can see, for instance, right here, web server one, that's the node that this information is targeted against, has a site named web server one site. Uh, let's see, credentials aren't secure. Nope. Uh, push the configuration to the node, pull the configuration from the nodes. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the exercise. Let's create a sandbox. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an automation account. That's necessary for the DSC to work in our environment. We're also gonna create a virtual machine that we're going to configure. And we're gonna show whether it's working or not as we configure it. All right, so our cloud shell is almost open. So we're gonna start off by creating a virtual machine. Uh, first off, we'll start off by creating a couple of variables. First one is the username and the second is the password. Uh, once that's done, we'll go ahead and we'll create a virtual machine with that username and password. All right, so I'll go ahead and paste this in and paste that in as well. All right, so first off, uh, what we're doing is we're, our first section here, we're creating a couple of variables. First off, we're creating a variable called username. 
called Azure user. So then creating a password with a random password in it, it's perfectly fine because that, that we don't know what it is because we're saving that in a variable. Next thing in the next section, we are going to create a virtual machine in Azure. Specifically, we're gonna call this MyVM. We're gonna make this Windows Server 2016 with a username of dollar sign username, which is this up here. So that will be Azure user, and then a password of dollar sign password, which is whatever this random password is. This will take a couple of minutes to create, and when it's done, it will give us a public IP address. Once that's done, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up port 80 on the firewall. Uh, port 80 is the traditional HTTP port, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to this uh, open port for the virtual machine in Azure, specifically port 80 for VM my VM. Let's see, so while that's running, let's go ahead and open up the Azure portal and we'll look into it. All resources. Now we see my VM, see virtual machine, virtual network, virtual machine, there we go. So there we have my VM virtual machine. We see the public IP right there. And that is still creating. It should be finishing any second now. If I remember correctly, the creation process not just cr not only creates the virtual machine, but actually powers it on and confirms that it's working properly. Uh, therefore, it takes a couple of extra moments for the VM to be created. However, with that being said, let's go ahead and see if we can get to this IP address. That's not what I wanted. Let's see, 40.112.175.65, and we should be getting a timeout. All right, so my session was for some reason taking exceptional, exceptionally long. Uh, so I went ahead and I just refreshed the page and we can see my shell is now up, up and running. So scroll back down to where we were. Uh, we now need to open up the virtual machine port. So first off, I'm on the VM right here. I'm sorry, I went to the IP right here and we can see, yes, we are not connecting, which is expected because of the firewall. If I then run this command to open the port on the virtual machine, and paste, well, we pretty much we'll end up with the same scenario. Even though the port will be open on the firewall to the virtual machine, there is no web server running on it, and therefore it won't actually work. Yeah, still, still timeout, no connection. Well, that's perfectly fine because, well, we are gonna be using an automation account in order to manage this machine. So for that, we need to go into the Azure portal and set up our automation account. So I'm gonna go back to my home. I'm gonna say create resource and we'll choose automation account. I'm just gonna type in automation. That's not it. Maybe that was it. There we go, yes. All right, so the name it needs to be globally unique, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do ECG automation account. There we go, subscription, yep, resource group, yep. Location, uh, that'll work for me. 
Uh, the option of whether I want this to be a run as account uh, is disabled because I'm not set up with enough capabilities to be able to do that. So I will just go ahead and say, or leave that as no, and then click create. So the automation account is what allows me to be able to run processes on these machines, as well as to set up an, a, a Power, PowerShell desired state configuration server to pull from. So first off, back into our command line, we want to open up a PowerShell session. So I'm just gonna type in PWSH. This allows me to have a PowerShell session through the Cloud Shell. There we go. Next thing I wanna do is I wanna create a file called mydscconfiguration.ps1. So let's go ahead and copy and paste that in there. It's gonna open it up in the code editor for PowerShell, or I'm sorry, for the uh, Cloud Shell. And I want to copy and paste this code into it. Control V, can't right click and paste. And then save and close the editor. Very briefly, what's going on here is we're creating a DSC file. Uh, the configuration we're calling my DSC configuration. For which node we're gonna run it on, it's gonna be localhost. Since all machines ha are configured as localhost, all machines I push this to will run it. In this node, I want to manage a Windows feature. Specifically, I want to manage the web server service and I want it to be present. Uh, okay, next, run the following command to upload your code to the DSC. Copy, paste, enter. Oh, apparently I need to, need to tweak that. Uh, right here it says your automation account name. I need to replace that with my account, ECG automation account. I believe that was my name. Yes, automation account right up there. Uh, let's see, if we look through this, import Azure RM uh, automation DSC configuration. So automation DSC configuration, we're importing to Azure, uh, specifically the account name, the resource group, and then the file was the file we just created, forced and published. Uh, let's see, after you upload, yep, and I need to manage it. Okay. So let's go back to our Azure portal. Very briefly, let's just refresh this page, make sure we're up to the latest versions of everything. Let's see, configuration management, and we have our state configuration right here. And then under configurations, we now have my DSC configuration right here. Uh, if need be, I could also have composed the configuration right here and created it myself with the source code, um, as well as adding additional configuration files manually. The lab has me do it through the, put, through the uh, PowerShell command. That works as well. All right, so under configurations, I see my DSC configuration. I'm then gonna say compile. What this does is it compiles it into a MOF file, M-O-F, <clears throat> and makes it something that DSC can start managing. <clears throat> uh, see, currently queued. starting and shortly will become completed. <clears throat> ah, there we go. There's the configuration source. If I wasn't sure about that, uh, I don't believe I can edit it in this view, but there are other edited editing views. Uh, 
All right, status is completed, so now I can move forward. And what I wanna do is I want to add my virtual machine, my machine that I had just created, as a node for this configuration. So back to my configuration, or to my automation account. State configuration, I want to add, no. Not under state configuration, I want to go to nodes. No, that's right, okay. St oh, excuse me, nodes, add. <laughs> it looks through and it says, hey, what VMs do you have? Well, obviously I only have the one, so I'm gonna go ahead and choose that, and then say connect. What node configuration do name do I want this to have? Uh, let's go ahead and call it <clears throat> that one right there. <coughs> Refresh frequency is every 30 minutes, so that's going to be how frequently it looks through, looks up to the, uh, let's see, which one is this? But yes, this is the one, uh, how frequently it will look up to the DSC server. So every 30 minutes, it will look to see if a change in the DSC has been defined. Uh, otherwise, it, every 15 minutes, it will look at the local machine to see if a change is necessary. What kind of configuration I want it to be? Do I want it to apply a monitor? So apply once and then alert me if any changes happen, happen later. Apply only, which means just apply and then never worry about it ever again. Or apply and autocorrect. So if we start drifting, should I move it back? I'll leave it as apply and monitor because maybe if something changes, I want to be alerted to that change, but not automatically resolve it. Uh, allow override, sure, and reboot if necessary, sure. After reboot, yeah, configure the, continue the configuration. Okay. So it's now configuring the client to point to our DSC server, and when it's done, it should start saying whether it's compliant or not. Connecting. Yeah, a little bit of background. What's happening here is it is actually going onto the virtual machine. It is running a PowerShell command in order to point it to this DSC server uh, and telling it exactly which configuration it should be using. At that point, we'll then be able to mod to see what the current configuration is. All right, it is taking its time. Uh, let's see, refresh. Yeah, so shortly this will actually show as green and hopefully with one machine being compliant. And when we're done, we should be able to refresh this web page and actually get access to the web server. All right, so I paused it for a second. We can see right now it's blue. One is actually listed as being in progress. If I refresh it as shortly, in progress right down there, uh, in a few seconds, that will change to compliant. So in progress means it has received the configuration. It is applying that configuration to the machine, which means it's installing the web server functions. And now we see it is compliant which means if I come back to the IP address up here, it should automatically refresh and start showing me a web server. It should, anyways. But there you have it, uh, defining DSC configurations. While I'm here, let's go ahead and just talk about looking for desired state configuration or PowerShell. DSC scripts or examples. Uh, there are tons of them online. 
<clears throat> this is a great way to be able to configure users, uh, service functions, uh, applications, and other configurations on your machines to make sure that they are standard amongst the entire environment.